Welcome to Johnsonville, home of America's number one sausage brand. With breakfast products that feature all natural ingredients, higher meat to fat ratio, and pure flavor with no artificial colors or flavors, it's no wonder that more than 70% of consumers say Johnsonville breakfast sausage is craveable. It's a favorite of chefs and operators too. Our links and patties are versatile enough for any menu and have less shrinkage and better hold times than other brands. So they'll travel well, save you money, and keep your customers happy. Find out how Johnsonville Sausage can help your operation. Contact your rep or visit us online. All right, it is my pleasure now to be joined by Ricky Richardson of Eggs Up Grill, uh, Betsy Ham of Duck Donuts, and Chef Charlie Bags, um, talking about breakfast trends and talking about breakfast strategy. Um, of course, breakfast is one of these day parts that we've been talking a lot about for the last 11 months. Uh, I think arguably, you know, for the first several weeks of the pandemic, we talked a lot about how much breakfast was struggling. We talked about how the switch to working from home had really uh, decimated the breakfast day part. But, you know, these experts are here to tell you breakfast is not dead. Breakfast has not gone away. People are still eating breakfast and there's still a ton of opportunity for breakfast going forward, both now during the pandemic and the, in the last few months, hopefully of the pandemic, but especially after that. Um, I want to start with Ricky, Ricky Richardson, the CEO of Eggs Up Grill. Uh, Ricky, I want to start by talking to you about Eggs Up Grill's response to the pandemic. Pandemic. Tell me about how the business needed to pivot, how you had to set up the operations of Exit Grill to respond to the new realities of the pandemic. Yeah, Sam, uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of uh, quick moves that took place um, when the pandemic fir first hit and impacted our restaurants back in March of 2020. First was doing uh, very important work to help our franchisees understand the situ situation, respond to figuring out a financial model that could enable them, also support them as they pursue some federal funding uh, and assistance. But from a, a guest-facing operational model, uh, we, we moved really quickly to simplify our menu offering. We wanted to, with dramatic decreases, initial dramatic decreases in sales, simplify that model that uh, lowered waste, uh, reduced the labor burden on our franchisees, but still offered a compelling uh, product offer to our guests and, ex and experience. Uh, from that became a significant focus on finding additional revenue streams. How do we make up for significant declines in dine-in guests? And uh, uh, Sam, what we really went after is how do we become very competitive in an area of the business uh, we had not focused on, which the off-premise area. So whether that was uh, call-in, take-out, online ordering, whether that was uh, third-party delivery, uh, really standing up that part of our business quickly. We moved uh, incredibly fast from a technology standpoint to deploy that across uh, our, our franchisees. And we've now quadrupled the amount of sales that we're doing in off-premise sales. Uh, near North of 20% of our total revenue comes from off-premise sales, uh, online ordering, third-party delivery, and phone, traditional phone in. So all the operational components that came along with that, not only the process to gain those orders, but how do you stage that in the kitchen? Do you have the right carriers for that? Uh, the packaging that goes along with that. And then uh, helping our franchisees understand the operational processes to do that at a very high level. We've been very pleased with, uh, with the revenue success and the profit impact on the business, uh, but also how our franchise partners have embraced that during this, uh, during this year. Yeah, you know, and Ricky, you, of course, represent uh, Eggs Up Grill is very much an experience that is is previous to the pandemic was especially a dine in experience um, compared with, you know, Betsy at Duck Donuts, which is has dine in. But I know you guys are also very much already off premises oriented. Um, but Ricky, for you guys, I mean, was that uh, was that pretty significant whiplash to lose that dine in experience? And how has the dine in piece of all of this evolved over the course of the pandemic? Yeah, Sam, it, it was very, very different. And there was a lot of conversations that needed to take place with our franchise partners to help them understand the opportunity here. That not only does it help in the short term during the immediacy of the pandemic, but building this revenue muscle and credibility there will help us as things uh, return to whatever the next normal becomes for our business. Uh, as we get in the second half of uh, the second quarter of this year, things I think will really begin to stabilize even more. So helping them understand that, wow, 
guests will consider us because of the credibility that we've earned already because of the type of experiences inside the restaurant we've provided over the history of this brand. So we have credibility, we have desire uh, with our guests to have that experience and have that product. So let's find the right ways to deliver that. First off is making sure the accuracy is there, right? Uh, because uh, you can't fix it when you forget something in a third party delivery order or a takeout order like you can uh, inside the restaurant. So really fascinate on the accuracy there. Make sure that we, where we do have that guest touch uh, that we have um, when they come pick it up, that it's ready on time, that we're, we greet them friendly uh, in, in a very friendly way, that we put surprise and delights in their packaging. Uh, so it could just be a note from the franchise owner thanking that guest when they open up that DoorDash order. And there's a personalized note from the franchisee to the guest uh, that we add those little touches that, uh, you know, we're all about, uh, um, you can see the background, this is my happy place. It's one of our themes uh, for inside of our restaurants. But how do we create that smile on the guests, finding those touch points, even when they're not inside of our restaurant? So convincing that there's a real meaningful opportunity here. It's not just a short-term opportunity. It's a long-term opportunity for the brand and then helping our franchisees. And it's still work that we're doing every day from a strategic standpoint, looking at all of these touch points. How do we bring that smile to guest faces when we're not in physical contact with them? Yeah. Uh, Betsy, let's go over to you. Um, let's talk about Duck Donuts, because uh, as I mentioned, I mean, you guys were already, I have to imagine, primarily off-premises oriented. Um, you know, I, I, my Duck Donuts is one of my daughter's favorite places to go, and we would we would often go and sit and, and eat there. But just as much, I'm sure people pick it up and grab a box to take it to work. So that must have been drastically altered by the pandemic. Betsy, tell me about the response that Duck Donuts has had to make to the pandemic. How have things really changed for the brand. Yeah, and absolutely, you're right. I, you know, a lot of our locations do primarily do pick up. Of course, we do have a lot of in dining, um, but just even how that pickup was occurring was totally different. So um, we had locations who maybe were setting up their um, their cash register outside for pickup. Um, we started implementing curbside pickup, um, which many of our locations didn't have. So just being able to make that pivot to have the technology piece. Um, the signage, the messaging um, for people to be able to just go to the restaurant and not even have to go inside. Um, that primarily was the change from pickup. And even just from a, we already had online ordering implemented, but lucky for us, one thing that did work out from a timing perspective is that we launched a new app and a loyalty program in February, right before COVID hit. Um, so that gave you the ability to also go on the app to order your donuts and still be able to have that made to order experience. Um, the other really big thing that, that really changed is um, going to customers. So in the very beginning of the pandemic, people really weren't out and about traveling. Of course, picking up donuts in the morning tends to be a, maybe a last minute decision for some people. So just not having people out. Um, we had franchisees who started going to where the customers were. So that really included, you know, neighborhood drop off. So they would put out an event for a, for a neighborhood. Somebody would host it. Everybody would go online, order their donuts ahead of time, and then the store would drop them off in one central location in a neighborhood. So um, we saw a lot of success in that, and that's something that our franchisees continued to do. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we only had one food truck um, that was out in the North Carolina market who had an, an incredible 2020, actually. Um, but that certainly has fueled um, other interest from other franchisees to, to get food trucks and trailers out on the road. So it has certainly shifted uh, how we deliver donuts to our customers. So speaking of that, you know, of course, I, I know the Duck Donuts experience very well. You guys, uh, it is, uh, again, an experience. I mean, similar to what we were just talking about with Ricky, where it's a sit down experience for Duck Donuts. It's walk along and watch your donuts being made. Of course, very appealing for children like mine. Um, how are you guys trying to recreate that experience without being able to leverage the traditional uh, in-store experience? Yes, that definitely did change. Um, for sure. And, you know, one of the things that we started doing that was new during uh, COVID was a do-it-yourself kit. So since you can't necessarily come into the store, watch the whole experience, we were selling kits, which were bare donuts, sprinkles, icing that you could choose on the side. So you could create that experience at home on your own. And for those of us who were stuck at home with kids, it was also really great entertainment value to, to give something for your kids to do. Um, the other thing that we started doing, and this really happened organically, is, you know, who isn't happy when they get to eat a donut, right? Like, this makes everyone happy. And, of course, everyone needed reasons to, to smile or to be happy over the last few months. So uh, we had franchisees who just naturally started dropping off donuts at 
you know, first line responders, um, essential workers, everything from, you know, grocery stores to police stations, the hospitals. Um, so it started a sprinkle happiness campaign for us. Um, so then we were encouraging customers to maybe sprinkle happiness to a friend or to, to a neighbor, you know, be able to deliver donuts to someone. Um, so that was really our campaign for a lot of last year was since you didn't really get to come in the store and have that maybe that same happy experience, um, but getting our franchisees as well as our customers to sprinkle happiness to those in their, in their neighborhood or in their life. That's great. Yeah, I want to get into talking some about menu. And to do that, I want to bring in Chef Charlie Bags really quick. Um, and after we talked with Chef uh, Charlie, we'll get into talking with uh, Betsy and Ricky about some of the menu innovations at your guys' restaurants. But um, Charlie, let's start by asking you, um, before the pandemic, what were the breakfast trends you were looking at? What was what was the deal with uh, breakfast menu innovation at that time? What was What was popular? What were chefs looking at? Well, I think, you know, I think going out for breakfast with your family is one of the funnest things to do, particularly on a Saturday morning. You don't have to dirty up the kitchen, get everybody around the table. Everybody can kind of customize their own breakfast. So I think there's a lot of uh, nostalgic and great uh, memories around breakfast uh, as it relates to kind of an event. You know, now during the pandemic, People are still obviously eating breakfast, but you have to provide a little more convenience for them and transportability. And it's a completely new experience. I think just from listening to both, uh, you know, Betsy and Ricky, it's still clear that the top priorities are going to be customer, the customers first, and a quality of product, and 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 cost control. You know, you have to drive profitability, but the customer is always going to be first. So I think we've had to listen to like, what is the customer looking for? So, you know, pre pandemic, I think that, you know, you might've saw a special of pancakes. that are much larger and just, you know, maybe two or three layers and really fun to eat and share. But now with delivery system, maybe we're, we're, we're showing like more like short stacks, things that can be stacked a little bit taller, have that more of an Instagrammable look to them you know, from a plate presentation standpoint. Uh, I think now it's a great opportunity for operators really just to take a look at what they were doing. And it's a perfect time to optimize your menu, change the things you've always been wanting to change, but you didn't think you could because there were certain customers that, you know, depended on it. But now you kind of have the license to adopt, you know, look at your menu mix and see what the heavy hitters are. You know, some of the things I've seen be really successful are utilizing like a pre-cooked sausage that has really consistent flavor, super easy from a labor saving standpoint, uh, but very consistent in size, you know, for doing biscuit sandwiches and things like this. Uh, food safety, I think is still gonna be really paramount, particularly now because, you know, you're making a product, you're holding it, and then there's a period of time before the guests eat it and we all know there's a certain time period uh, when you want to consume food that's uh, in a particular temperature zone. Uh, you know, regional menu ideas, I think, you know, even for you, Betsy, I know she have like the bacon on a, the bacon on a donut, you know, that, that represents the salty and the sweet trend. And there's always going to be people that crave salty and sweet. Sweet and sour is also really kind of a, a craveable taste combination. So this is a really good time to really leverage the tastes that are truly craveable that we can learn from cuisines around the world and, and regionally. Uh, you know, in Ricky's menu, you know, you have uh, you have a hollandaise on your menu, right? With your uh, your products, and you know, a hollandaise it's a it's a workhorse. It's kind of like an Alfredo sauce or a gravy. There's so many things you can do to those with like plus one applications. So, you know, with Ricky's uh, hollandaise sauce, you know, he can add some fresh basil to that and maybe some chopped uh, sun-dried tomatoes and have a very fresh, uh, kind of a healthy halo perspective on kind of a new Oscar or a layered sandwich, maybe with a poached egg. You know, going, focusing in on some of the classic cooking techniques. You know, I really like to take uh, like a soup cup put plastic wrap, push it down, put a raw egg in there, and then a little dollop of fresh basil, and then uh, put it together, twist tie it, 
and poach it. And now you've got a poached egg that's infused with basil. But can you imagine, Ricky, you can do that with chorizo. You know, you can do it with the different, you know, a mixture of salsa verde or whatever. You know, I can give you like a hundred ideas. To, but, you know, what's excited is just really Excellent. leverage classic cooking techniques and, uh, and come up with new ways to serve the same foods that you have on your menu. And then I, I think the, the last thing really for both, you know, Betsy and Ricky and their operations is cross utilizing ingredients. It's so important that we manage our inventory and we get the most out of that inventory. So if you can create 10, you know, menu items with one ingredient, but they all seem unique, you know, it's a very clever way to design a menu and it's, it's very cost effective and it helps you turn your inventory. Uh, you know, authenticity, you know, if you're going to do something like a hollandaise, just make sure the hollandaise is done really well. It's very authentic. You know, it's got really nice creaminess, great balance of taste. You know, you know, with the hollandaise, there's a little bit of acidity from the lemon and a little bit of salt and just the beautiful texture and flavor of eggs. You know, it's, it's a winning combination for sure. Uh, and then, you know, egg bakes are something that I've seen kind of popping up, you know, egg bakes remind me of my Aunt Martha, you know, everything was in a casserole in her kitchen, but an egg bake's a perfect place to cross utilize ingredients. So Betsy, where this might come into play for you is, you know, like doing a bread pudding with leftover donuts. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, you know, like an apple fritter is a combination of your yeast-based donuts chopped up with apples and cinnamon and sugar and then, you know, you form it into a fritter and fry it and then you glaze it. So that's a, you know, a fritter is an example of cross utilizing leftover ingredients. But, you know, to this day, I think the fritter is my favorite, one of my favorite donuts, but, it, it, you know, it's made from the leftovers in, in essence. Uh, sometimes they're so popular, you don't have enough leftovers. Uh, but then, um, you know, on sandwiches, you know, sandwiches are a great carry out item. I think now you have the liberty of using other types of carriers, you know, biscuit works well in the brioche bun. But, you know, when I use, a, I make this one sandwich where I use like a sausage link and then I use a small long bun, kind of like a half of a hot dog bun, but it's specially designed to be the right length. I think things that are in like a hot dog bun you know, for Betsy, it's the long john. Sometimes, you know, eating the long john, it's just so ergonomically, uh, you know, fitting from a design standpoint. Uh, but I think, you know, looking out of the box, you know, Ricky, in your case, and creating sandwiches with a hoagie bun and, you know, kind of breaking out of the, the mold a little bit sure. and adding some creativity. And uh, lastly, every dish that we're all going to prepare has a base that's usually some type of a carbohydrate like a carrier a pancake a waffle a bun or a donut then you have your protein matrix which can be meat base or plant base you have uh, a sauce the sauce could be a honey butter or it could be a chipotle aioli and then you have a garnish you know the garnish adds color uh, and texture you know, I wonder when the day comes when we start serving donuts with a bouche of microgreens on top. You know, it's probably not that far. If you can put bacon on it, you know, why not put some uh, arugula microgreens and really blow people's minds, you know? So anyway, it's a time to get creative and have fun with your customers, but listen to the customers and focus on quality. I like that we've we've turned this into free consultation period for eggs up grill and duck donuts. This is yes, good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. That's really good stuff. You just see yeah. all the notes I have written. I appreciate yeah. that, Chef Charlie. Thank you. Yeah, we true. should we do this. To talk. Do this more often. That's right. Well, Ricky, let, Ricky, let's talk to you about some of that innovation stuff with eggs up grill. I mean, a lot of what Chef Charlie was just talking about clearly um, comes back to can this travel well? Because I think that's been such a, a consideration lately. Ricky, tell me about menu innovation at Eggs Up Grill. I mean, have you guys even bothered to, to tinker with the menu in this season? How much do you have to work into this idea of does this travel? Yeah, it, quite a bit, uh, quite a bit, Sam. And, and leveraging what Chef Charlie was talking about, uh, the portability, uh, what we call portability is incredibly important right now. 
I talked about the focus on off-premise. Uh, you know, fortunately, we had we were ready to launch uh, the end of March uh, an everyday value type platform that we called Biscuits, Bowls, and Burgers. So sandwiches around biscuits, uh, um, home fries is the base for a number of different bowl flavors, and then burgers. We had uh, introduced, upgraded our whole burger line late last uh, uh, September of two thousand and nineteen, uh, and target, as I said, an everyday value platform of the three, what we call 3B. Because of the focus on portability, uh, these had also been targeted at lunch where we had, even though we didn't do much off-premise, we over-indexed on lunch off-premise uh, in our total uh, revenue, was portability being a hugely important piece of this. So we fortunately had this innovation platform that we were bringing to market, but we have really amplified that. We've refreshed it twice since the pandemic hit from some new products. Uh, that we have put out there. So portability continues to be one of the main filters that we have on product innovation. And I believe will continue to be given the significance of our third, third party delivery and all off-premise focus. Um, we slowed down the cadence of, of innovation. You ask about impact on innovation. Not only did we have this biscuits, bowls, and burgers, but we've been on a cadence of about five times a year, we would do an LTO, uh, limited time offer, typically uh, two to three breakfast items, one lunch item would be that profile. We cut that cadence in half, and in fact, uh, we were going to launch in mid-April. Uh, we put that on the shelf until uh, end of June and brought that out, again, just to help our ourselves understand the landscape, what are guests looking for, making sure the products that we had already developed and the themes we developed around that were going to make sense. Uh, we tweaked the theme a bit um, um, and Awaken to Bacon be became the new theme for that. And we wanted to put try to create a smile on guest face when they saw that. But as we got to the summer in the markets that we do business in, things had, had um, improved a bit. People were feeling a little bit more, uh, I think, confident in how, what the pandemic, how it was impacting their lives. Maybe some of that was a little bit premature for sure. But uh, we, we brought a smile to people's face with the theme. We had products that, uh, you know, who doesn't like bacon? Uh, so we had very popular products that we brought forward. We did that on, on breakfast offerings. We did that on uh, some burgers that we had. It was a theme around our bowls and our biscuits as well. So slower, uh, reduce the cadence of the innovation, try to stay very true to what our DNA was with the theme of these products, uh, and then stayed on brand with it as we went forward. We've just launched a second one. Um, product innovation line uh, that we're bringing forward. Eat Happy is, is this theme uh, of the new product innovation that we have. We have a strawberry stuffed French toast uh, with some cream cheese frosting. That's the hero of that platform. We've introduced uh, uh, Crab Cakes Benedict for the first time. Coastal Crab Cakes Benedict is what we're calling it. Uh, and we've got some burger options and sandwich options as well. So a little bit uh, shorter cadence, not quite as broad. Uh, of uh, product offers we've typically done. Uh, and also to Chef uh, Charlie's earlier point, cross utilization of existing products. Uh, we're featuring four new products, right? Four new items right now, menu offers right now, but only one new product or one new SKU that came on board. And that was a crab cake. Uh, everything else that we're using in our platforms are existing uh, ingredients or existing ingredients built a little bit different way. Got it. Yeah, Betsy, I have to imagine you guys were pretty prepared for uh, how how does my food travel, right? You guys yeah. uh, already being well prepared for off premises. Uh, and um, but, you know, for, for duck donuts, I was thinking how, you know, you guys have really wildly creative donuts. And again, it's there's sort of an experience in going in and being able to design it. But something that's become a theme, I think, throughout the last year has really been, um, you know, a focus on comfort and a focus on fun in our food and finding relief uh, in in our food choices. I'm wondering how that's come into play for Duck Donuts. How, how much have you guys really kind of leaned into our product as a as, as something that can sort of take the tension off and relieve some of your stress? Has that become part of your, your message in this season? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it kind of goes back to that whole sprinkle happiness campaign that, that started organically last year where, you know, eating donuts does tend to make people happy and, and, and surprising people with donuts tends to make people happy as well. So 
Um, and, you know, the other interesting thing from a messaging standpoint is typically pre-COVID, we do really well with catering and special events. So people celebrating, whether it's birthdays or gender reveal parties, weddings, you know, all of these special occasions that happen in people's lives, Duck Donuts gets to be a part of, which is really awesome. So, you know, having that shift away from obviously not a lot of those bigger events taking place, um, we were really trying to get people to celebrate just the, the day-to-day of, of life. Um, when we're not necessarily having the big parties or the big office meetings, um, but knowing that donuts are still there um, and, and getting people to realize that that could be part of their, their day-to-day celebration as well. Yeah, one thing I actually wanted to bring up as well, I mean, obviously a big piece of this conversation is that we're all talking about breakfast as if it's, um, you know, just one day part. But the truth of the matter is, of course, people eat breakfast all day long. Um, Duck Donuts, I know you guys, uh, you are open all day. And I know that you have some items that are not necessarily breakfast items. Uh, I know that there's ice cream. Um, And then, of course, Ricky at Eggs Up Grill, you guys also have brunch and lunch. Um, You know, so a big piece of the conversation during the pandemic has been the morning hours specifically change, I think, because of working from home. It just changed everybody's routine, but maybe didn't change how much they're eating breakfast foods. Um, Betsy, let's start with you and talk about Doug Donuts. How has the shift, what's the, the shift in day parts specifically been like? How are you guys trying to adjust to when your customers are coming in your stores now? Yeah, no, that's a great question. We definitely did see a shift in not having as much of that early, you know, 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. type of uh, traffic. And, and as you mentioned, it really goes back to, I think, people not necessarily going to an office, being out and about a lot of times when schools weren't open. Um, so we did see more of a shift into that afternoon or even later afternoon. And that especially still continues to hold true for us during the week versus the weekend. So we still see less traffic um, during that morning, during the week but then we're making up for it on the weekend. So it's just been a very interesting shift that, you know, here almost a year later, we still continue to see that that early AM um, drive just really being down. Have you guys tweaked your menu at all to respond to different day parts? Are you just relying on, on the menu as it was? Yeah, not necessarily changing the menu. I think being more cognizant of the messaging um, and also focusing on, of course, coffees and espressos, which can be, you know, consumed throughout the day, of course. And and you mentioned milkshakes and ice cream. Uh, We did launch milkshakes as an optional product last year, which did really, really well. And that's something that we'll be rolling out nationally here for this um, upcoming summer. Um, So focusing on milkshakes. And then we also have donut sandwiches. They tend to be donut breakfast sandwiches. Um, You know, we take a donut, cut it in half, put, you know, eggs, um, bacon, sausage, and get the maple icing on top if you want to be um, really good. Have a really good breakfast sandwich. Um, so that's something that we continue to see that area grow. So looking at you know future menu, do we do other things with sandwiches? So you know, do we make it a lunchtime sandwich? Is there some type of meat or some kind of protein on it that we could focus on that in the afternoon to get that afternoon traffic back up? Ricky, uh, Eggs Up Grill, I know, um, of course, being breakfast, brunch, and lunch, um, what's, what's the day part situation been like for you guys? How much have things changed? I know you and I have spoken before, too, about how the weekday weekend split kind of shifted a little bit as well. Tell us about what the business has been like for you guys. Sure. You know, Wob, the, uh, the work from home situation certainly impacted uh, those in the QSR space that that uh, had a breakfast offering. As, as I shared with you earlier, Sam, we saw actually a pickup in it. Again, uh, most of our early morning weekday traffic were typically retirees in the past. So we, we certainly saw less traffic from that particular guest segment. Uh, we, not as many business meetings taking place, but what we did see uh, again in the off-premise window is we saw a lot of, uh, because a lot of children weren't in school at that time as well, there was more family meals. We, we developed uh, what we call family bundles, a range of uh, packaged meals for a family of four, and you could dial it up or dial it down as far as the numbers, whether that was uh, pancake-based or egg-based or, or breakfast sandwich-based. So we saw more of that traffic around family bundles. As people were working from home, children home from school, you had, a, uh, you had more of these more traditional weekend-type occasions where the, they would be eating at home, but where the family would be together. Uh, so convenience was important there, but also families eating together for a breakfast occasion during the week. Um, obviously, we saw uh, continue to see a, uh, a spike in our total revenues across the weekends. As Chef uh, Charlie was talking about earlier, breakfast is very much a social occasion. It does bring a lot of nostalgic, nostalgic thoughts to, to a lot of people's minds. So uh, we continue to see that index. And as we've, uh, you know, we're very fortunate uh, in our recovery. Uh, last, uh, the last month, we've been at about 97% of our prior year sales 
uh, even with this. So um, we are being bolstered by that off-premise focus continuing to grow on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, but we're getting dining room traffic back in there. We just had record weekends with uh, record sales across a number of restaurants this past weekend with Valentine's Day following on a Sunday this year. So uh, a long answer to your short question about impact on day parts. Uh, we did see some that work from home benefit during the weekdays. And uh, as people are getting more comfortable now, we're seeing uh, more return to the more traditional weekend based uh, dine in uh, occasions. That's so interesting to talk about uh, a boost from the working from home uh, situation. <laughs> I don't think a lot of restaurants are are thinking about that. Um, Charlie, I want to get over back to you to talk a little bit more about some specifics with menu innovation again. Um, you know, Ricky brings up this great point, which is um, how much about uh, dining, how much about food service occasions, the need states these days are really group oriented. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about what you think menu innovators should do with breakfast as it relates to so much of our, our eating occasions now being group-based, being social, even if they're socially distant, what should people keep in mind as they develop breakfast menus, as they consider that more? Well, you know, when you're feeding a group, there's a couple important components that I think you must consider. One of them is you're going to have to offer items that are very easily customizable because everybody has a different opinion and taste. Uh, one of the ways to do this is provide food that's prepared and it's chilled that can be warmed up at any given time. I went into a local restaurant and I picked up one of a couple of their cold dishes just to support them. I went home and heated them up in the oven. They were unbelievable, as good as they would be in the restaurant. So I think there's a real opportunity, but you have to educate the customers on kind of that takeout perspective. Uh, you know, I think offering uh, family dining as an option where the whole family is sitting down, having the same basic meal, you know, maybe they can customize a little bit with sauces and things like this or the amount of potatoes versus protein or something. But family dining packages is super important. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention before I forget that kind of ties into this is, Ricky, the, uh, the Chinese to-go container. I think is the best takeout container there is on the market. It keeps food so hot. You know, when you get your food and it's still piping hot. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So anyway, a lot, quite often <laughs> that style of packaging is forgotten, but I particularly like on brunch bowls and uh, different things that you could do, Betsy. Uh, I think offering fresh, fresh fruit to give a healthy halo to, for example, for each of your concepts. So with fresh fruit, you know, Fruit's so perishable, so you might be concerned about that, but you can offer par parfaits in a clear container where you can see layers. And in Betsy's case, you could have a certain type of donut that was chopped up in the middle of one, or maybe you just have a whole donut that's in the middle. Uh, Very good. Cute. But you could do you could do smoothies. You know, coolies are something that you could use as a sauce. You know, that's kind of like a fruit sauce, uh, a coolie, and then you can do fruit shakes anything with ice cream in it is going to make it better. <laughs> so, and that's just an example of five things you can do with fresh fruit, uh, you know, to help you make sure you turn inventory. Uh, let me see, given, particularly on the to-go stuff, when you pack your food up, if you can give uh, pictures of ways to present your product to make it Instagrammable, to make it fun for your, your, your customers, they can see a picture and they're like, hey, let's try to build this just like it. You know, everybody's got a kid in their family that's into Legos or something, you know, let them do it with their food. You know, and maybe you add a, you know, in your case, Ricky, maybe it's a stack of pancakes and you give them a small skewer. So they stack right. the pancakes put a skewer with the sausage in the top and then, you know, drizzle syrup over the top and, you know, you can do a time lapse. But, you know, create options like that to make it fun for people because they are going to Instagram your food. So yeah, encourage them to, to make it look, uh, to look really nice. And then, you know, on, if it's okay, I just keep referring to each of you, but you know, you both have really inspired me, but you know, Betsy would, when, when you eat a donut, the thing that makes it so craveable is when it melts in your mouth. So you, you take a bite of your donut and then you sip your tea or your coffee. So I think there's a real opportunity to educate people on different types of teas and coffees that go well with donuts. 
because functionally it helps the sugar melt in your mouth and that's part of what makes it craveable and it'll keep people eating more if you dissolve those sugars. If you just eat a donut without anything to drink, it's just a different experience. So I, I think there's something uh, something to that. And then uh, the cake donut batter is a great medium to dip sausage. Instead of corn dogs, you can make little sausage dogs using cake batter. You can do it on a stick or, you know, something like that. Um, um, and then this is kind of a perfect a uh, personal preference because I'm a chef and I travel the world and I study food. My kids are pretty well acclimated <laughs> to global cuisines, but I always appreciate restaurants that have beautiful dishes, just smaller portions for the kids. My kids do not want to go in and eat something made for kids. <laughs> you know, they, they just think it's like, why can't I eat what you're eating dad? Well, you can, and I usually order it for them, but it's just too much. So then I overeat and then I become a plump chef, which isn't <laughs> always desirable. But I, I think restaurants have a great opportunity to treat kids kind of like adults or with respect and just you know, really dial in on those portions for the kids. So maybe that's, for example, making a smaller biscuit. Can you imagine a biscuit and gravy on a small plate with two small biscuits, something like that? And then... Uh, and then feeding large groups of people uh, have ways for them not only to customize it, but to heat it and eat it at different time periods. The way that people are kind of coming and going. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that was my summary. Uh, sure. Yeah, it's good. Uh, you know, you, you, you mentioned, Charlie, this idea of Instagram ability, and you've, you've hit on this idea of presentation. Um, I, I, I want to dig into that a little bit because, um, you know, of course, everything right now I'm talking about, I'm sure everything you guys that are thinking about is oriented around the digital experience, right? Um, so much of the ways in which consumers are engaging with their favorite restaurants today are around digital tools. And that has implications, of course, for how you present your brand through these digital platforms, how you capture their attention and how you get them to crave your food when they're doing it from their device, right? And so I want to explore that a little bit. Betsy, let's start with you with Duck Donuts. Um, you know, as you guys are on these platforms, as you're directing a lot of your business around off-premises, how do you, I mean, we talked a little bit about, you know, transferring the experience over to off-premises channels, but specifically as it relates to these digital platforms, how are you really uh, being able to uh, present that and communicate that in such a way that people are still coming to Duck Donuts for, for their breakfast needs? Yeah, we rely heavily definitely on digital really as our main advertising marketing tool, um, you know, primarily Facebook and Instagram. And it's, it's great when we can, can control the content and, you know, make sure the pictures are all the most beautiful donuts that we have. Um, so it's always interesting when you follow like the hashtag of Duck Donuts, of course, sometimes we see a little bit of inconsistency in the, in the presentation. So just trying to be really mindful of that, that the, that the donuts always are beautiful and have, you know, when you see that, that you want those donuts. Um, and then trying to transfer that into online ordering. So pushing, you know, online ordering, pushing the loyalty program, pushing the app um, and, and making sure that experience is um, easy, just as it is in the store. So I think that's an area where we'll still continue to focus and we have some opportunity for growth is, you know, the great thing about our product is that you get to build your own donuts. Um, the hard thing is, is that you get to build your own donut. So just the user experience of picking, you know, a coating, a topping, a drizzle online can be a little bit cumbersome. Um, so we're trying to make that more of a visual experience, whether it's in store or especially online. So um, that's something that we continue to be focused on because knowing that that's not going to go away. That's not just a, you know, because of COVID type of thing. We continue to see our online ordering uh, percentages increase. You know, we're probably around 25% still. Um, so just making sure that that experience is easy for customers and that that's not going to um, deter them from ordering through, through any, whether it's our app or through our online system. Yeah. Uh, Ricky, for you guys at Eggs Up Grill, um, I know a lot of these platforms, I think, were, were fairly new for you guys, um, as you've talked about. Uh, how, how did you guys really focus on how you presented the brand on these digital channels and, and could really, um, again, capture that attention of the customer, especially, by the way, when the virtual marketplace is just 
you know, packed with brands at this point because everybody's participating here. How, how did you make it Eggs Up Grill really rise above? You know, Sam, I think that um, you're right. We are, uh, in relative terms, new to, to social media as a channel for us really since uh, we've taken over the brand a couple of years ago, really focused on that with our uh, local franchisees. That local franchise partner is such an important part of the winning formula of Eggs Up Grill that we wanted to make uh, – make sure we are enabling them to do a great job with it. It's interesting, we see much higher engagement on more organic type posts, whether those are organic posts that guests take for themselves or our franchise partners do for themselves. So yeah, from somebody with uh, who's grown up in the restaurant business, worked in big brands before, I, I share some uh, a little bit of the angst that Betsy was, I think I heard in her voice there, if you see something that, that gets posted that's not exactly how it was described in, in the recipe or or uh, if you had a food stylist, or if you did it in a test kitchen, exactly how you'd want it to look. But those are oftentimes the type of posts that get the most engagement for us. And really, when it's when it's a, someone who's taken the product home, as we were talking about earlier, I love Chef Charlie's ideas around giving directions on how to make uh, make your food Instagram worthy when somebody takes it home for you. That's the best of both worlds there, right? You get the organic nature of one of your guests uh, enjoying your food and, and showing it off, and they've added some of their own personal touch to it. But um, again, enabling our franchise partners to understand, helping understand the importance of uh, the role of social media and helping uh, potential guests and current guests uh, feel more engaged with your brand and participatory in your brand was a really strategic and important initiative for us. Uh, and then uh, how, do we, how do we create food? I, I mentioned the strawberry stuffed French toast that we did. We, we've got a totally new presentation there where we've quartered the two pieces of French toast with a strawberry glaze frosting in the middle. We stand those on end uh, on, the, uh, on the plate. So you've got uh, four wedges of French toast st stood up, uh, powdered sugar on top of that with a drizzle of lion's chocolate sauce across the top. So it, uh, it doesn't have to be perfect and it still looks really, really good uh, when it's done from an organic standpoint. There's a lot of color, there's a lot of texture that's visible to that. And, uh, uh, as we all know, guests eat with their eyes first. And this is a product that does a really nice job with that. Well, I'll tell you, I ate lunch right before this, but uh, I think I'm still going to be uh, very hungry coming out of this and, <laughs> and go <laughs> go grab some breakfast food. That's for sure. Um, as we wrap up, I wanted to make sure we just touched on the future of breakfast a little bit here, because I think a lot of people listening in are really wondering about how do we, you know, really formulate our breakfast menus or our breakfast day part so that it fits the post pandemic future. Um, so I want to ask each of you about your thoughts on the future and chef Charlie, I'm going to start with you. Um, just your thoughts first about um, menu innovation as we move forward, what do you foresee as being some of the areas to focus on for people who are innovating around their menus as we go out of the pandemic? Um, well, first I would look at the, I would look at the opportunity as a market of clockless diners because people are eating breakfast all day long now. So it gives you the ability to sneak in some savory, maybe some uh, chilies. Uh, it's a great opportunity to bring in different types of spice, you know, between ancho, pasillo, wahilo, you know, chipotle has been around for a while, you know, like a smoked jalapeno, but there's so much opportunity with these chilies to drive craveability. Uh, using things like fresh salsas, I could give you a hundred recipes for fresh salsas that would just, you know, tantalize one's palate. You know, they're just so fresh and when they make your mouth water, you know, when you use them in combination with protein and carbohydrates. Uh, I think, you know, embracing sous vide really for both of your operations, sous vide is so easy to do and you could put a hundred raw eggs in a shell in water and turn the water on to a set temperature and you could perfectly poach those and keep them at that temperature for you know a four hour period of time. And then you just crack it and it's a perfectly poached egg. So embrace some technology. Uh, and you know I think there's a tremendous opportunity to do poached eggs perfectly. People are scared to do poached eggs because it's difficult. But if you use sous vide technology, it really makes it easy. So it could give you kind of a, a leg up on your competition. 
I can keep going, but there's a little bit. <laughs> that's good. No, that's really great. Uh, Betsy, let's talk to you about Duck Donuts. Um, you know, of course, one thing I should say, too, is um, it just feels like, you know, no matter what, everybody has changed from this season. And even if we go back to, quote unquote, business as usual, I think there's just lots of ways in which we, we will uh, inevitably be be quite different. How will Duck Donuts be different? How are you guys going to explore the breakfast day part and the breakfast offering differently? You know, I think the, the biggest thing that we're focused on right now is the convenience factor. So um, it goes back to, of course, I think that was pre-COVID and we'll continue to be post being as convenient as an offering as possible. We currently don't have any drive through So looking at if that makes sense for our operation or not. Um, some more to come on that, hopefully in, in the near future. But I, I think it goes back to that convenience piece. And, you know, one of our customers that we really relied on in the past was that office hero is what we call them. So they're the ones grabbing, you know, a couple dozen of donuts before going to the office. And that may continue to be looking a little different in the future if not everyone's going back to offices on a regular basis. So it goes back to how can we drive that frequency of the regular customer during the week. So it, it really comes down to the menu innovation. And if it is different kinds of sandwiches or maybe it's some add-ons or maybe it's, you know, adding hash browns to the menu. So making a little bit more of a variety of options. And really, I think for us personally, um, focusing more on beverages, that's certainly a great opportunity as well. So I think giving the customer a couple different options and reasons to come back um, while not trying to complicate the menu or certainly the operation as well. Mm. Yeah. Ricky, I'm going to leave you with the final word. Tell us how Eggs Up Grill will really have been changed by this pandemic season. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, we remain incredibly bullish on the opportunity in the breakfast space for all the reasons we've, we've talked about today, uh, from the social aspect of it, the, you know, people getting together and connecting, the nostalgic aspect, the craveability of, of savory and sweet flavors. So incredibly bullish on, on the future opportunity. What's changed about us is uh, our respect for and our passion for finding um, revenue channels that fit this brand, different revenue channels that we haven't had before. I've talked about off-premise, but we've introduced adult beverages. Uh, mimosas has been our first step and, and been incredibly shocked by the, the popularity of those drinks. We only have them in about a quarter of the system right now as others get licensed. So, um, you know, I'll use off-premise as one example. Adult beverages is another example. Just told what would have been thinking outside of the box for us 12 months ago that has become a, how we wake up every day now. How can we continue to in an on-brand way, push the envelope here. Uh, Betsy talked about convenience, a huge opportunity for us as well. Take that friction, all points of friction out of the guest experience, whether that's further leveraging technology uh, across the entire experience, whether that's dine-in or off-premise. Um, curbside's a great example of that contactless experience is online ordering. Uh, we're about to go live with uh, Olo as, uh, as a facilitator for our third-party uh, ordering platform as well. So just getting much more aggressive and, and much, uh, much faster in bringing ideas forward. I think I may have mentioned that to you, Sam, before that it, it's about moving with speed and purpose uh, across these strategic initiatives for us to uh, bolster our business model. I think we'll be in much unfortunate what we experience, but uh, we're going to be in much stronger position as a brand as we come out of this. I'm very excited about the future. Well, it's a really great note to end on. I have no doubt that breakfast is going to uh, remain a very important part of consumers' days and uh, of consumers' bellies. So um, thank you to uh, Charlie, thank you to Betsy, and thank you to Ricky for taking some time to share about Breakfast Trends today. I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.